Hi, uh, so let's continue studying for the final. So there is a review problem for final uh, sheets. There are review pro problems for final sheets that I put on Blackboard. So, um, so refer to those now for this video. Uh, we're gonna start with the beginning. Um, so these are just a list of problems that I think you could use to practice for. Uh, this is not the way the final will look. It's just a, a list of of problems to study, okay? So let's start from the beginning. Um, so number one um, is A is estimate the area under the graph of f y equals one over x from x equals one to x equals five uh, using four approximating rectangles and right endpoints. Sketch the graph and the rectangles. Okay, so um, let's sketch the graph of y equals one over x. Okay, that's the graph of y equals 1 over x. We're going from x equals 1 to x equals 5. And we're going to use four approximating rectangles. And so that means that the endpoints are at 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And we're going to use right endpoints. And so the first subinterval will have this as a right endpoint, the second subinterval will have that as a right endpoint, the third subinterval will have that as a right endpoint, and the fourth subinterval will have that as a right endpoint. So you just take the height of the function at those right endpoints. That's the height of each corresponding rectangle. Okay? Okay, and so now the sum of the areas of those four approximating rectangles is an approximation to the area under the curve y equals 1 over x from x equals 1 to x equals 5. So here we sketch the graph and the rectangles. And so we're going to estimate the area. So the area is approximately the sum of those four rectangles, which is... Um, which is f of two times one plus f of three times one plus f of four times one plus f of five times one times one. This is f of x like this. f of x equals one over x. And so then this is equal to one half times one plus one third times one plus one fourth times one plus one fifth times one. So it's just the sum of one half plus one third plus one fourth plus one fifth. And so I'm gonna write this as one common, one fraction. So the common denominator here, I would say, is two squared times three times five, which is 60. The common denominator is 60. And so you get 30 plus 20 plus 15 plus 12 over 60. And so that's equal to, uh, 77 over 60. That's, that is an approximation to the area. Okay. And so this is an underestimate. This is an underestimate. It's an underestimate because the area of the four rectangles takes up less, is the four rectangles take up less space than the area under the curve. And so this is an underestimate of the area. All right, and so that's part A of number one, okay? All right, good. So if that makes sense, uh, let's do part B. All right, so part B. Um, we're going to repeat part A using left endpoints. So it's the same graph, um, x-axis, y-axis, y equals 1 over x, x equals 1, x equals 5, four subintervals of equal length, 2, 3, 4, okay, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 are the endpoints of each subinterval. Now we're going to use left endpoints, so the left endpoint of first subinterval is 1, the left endpoint of second subinterval is 2, the left endpoint of left end point of the third subintervals is three and the left end point of the fourth subintervals is four. Now I'm going to take the height of the functions at those points and those will be the heights of the corresponding rectangles. This is drawing the rectangles with those heights. Okay, so those are four approximating rectangles to the area. Okay, if you add up the areas of those four rectangles, that's an approximation to the area of the curve. And so area is approximately f of one times one plus f of two times 1 plus f of 3 times 1 plus f of 4 times 1, okay? The area of the first rectangle, the area of the second, area of the third, and area of the fourth. And so that's equal to, this is f of x, 
looks like in part A. This is 1 over 1 times 1, which is 1 over 1, 1 half, plus 1 third, plus 1 fourth. Now we're going to add the areas of these right here. The, the least common denominator is 12. So 12, so you have 12 plus 6 plus 4 plus 3 over 12. And so you get 25 over 12. Okay, that's 18, 22, 25 over 12. And so 25 over 12 is an approximation of that area. This is an overestimate. This is an overestimate. Because the, the, four rec the four approximate rectangles take up more space than the area under the curve. See, right? This is the, this is the curve. What's underneath is the area under the curve. The rectangles take up all that space, and they take up extra space. They take up this extra space, this extra, extra space, that extra space. And I'm going to highlight it there. And this extra space. Okay, so this is an overestimate of that area. So that's 1B. That's number one. Number two. Number two. Um, use the midpoint rule with the given value of n to approximate the integral. So this is the only part, from part A, which is the only part of two. Uh, and so we're going to approximate the definite integral from one to five of x minus one over x plus one dx, and where n equals four. And we're going to use the midpoint rule now for this one. So we use the right endpoint rule, the left endpoint rule, and now we're using the midpoint rule. Uh, so what's the graph of y equals x minus 1 over x plus 1? Uh, oh, okay, so you know what? We don't need to graph it. Uh, right, so the, um, to estimate it, its value, we don't need to graph it. And so let's call this f of x. Okay? So then if you look at the subinterval from 1 to 5, okay? um, this is 1 to 5, and we're going to separate into four equal subintervals. Then we have 2, 3, and 4, just like the last problem. Now we're taking the midpoint of each subinterval. Okay, so the midpoint here is 1.5, this is 2.5, that's 3.5, and that's 4.5. Okay, the subintervals are length 1, and the midpoints are in between. Right? Okay, so that's where the, the, the midpoints are. And so you can approximate this by saying it's f of 1.5 times the length of subintervals, which is 1, plus f of 2.5 times the length of subintervals, which is 1, plus f of 3.5 times the length of subintervals, 1, plus f of 4.5 times the length of subintervals, which is 1. And so that's equal to, you just plug in, you find the values of f, you plug them in here, you have 1.5 minus 1 over 1.5 plus 1, plus 2.5 minus 1 over 2.5 plus 1, plus 3.5 minus 1 over 3.5 plus 1, plus 4.5 minus 1 over 4.5 plus 1. And so that's, you just multiply each by 1, so it's just that. And so you get 0.5 over 2.5, plus 1.5 over 3.5, plus 2.5 over 4.5, plus 3.5 over 5.5, okay? This is one half over five halves. So you get one fifth there. This is um, three halves over seven halves, so you get three sevenths. This is five halves over nine halves, so you get five ninths. And this is um, seven halves over 11 halves, so you get seven eleven fifths. So you just added those fractions up and you get the final answer. The least common denominator is going to be 5 times 7 times 9 times 11. Um, so when you add those fractions, you get... Um, so actually, I might just write it as a decimal. So this is a decimal, it's 0 0.2. 0 1 fifth is a decimal, is 0 0.2. 3 sevenths as a decimal is about 0 0.42. Uh, 
0.43 rounds of the nearest hundred. Um, five dimes is 0 0.55, 0 0.56 rounds of the nearest hundred, and seven elevenths is um, 0 0.63, 0 0.64 rounds of the nearest hundred. Okay, so if that's just I'm just adding up them as decimals, and so now if this is Okay, so then we have 13 here. Okay, and so you have 1.83. The sum of those decimals, 1.83. All right, that's an, that is an approximation of the area of that 1.3. So that's two, that's number two. So that's a good overview of approximating using left end points, right end points, and mid points. So after number two is number three. So for number three, use part one of the fundamental theorem of calculus to find the derivative of the function. So for three a, the function is g of x is equal to the def integral from one to x of 2 plus t to the 4th raised to the 5th power dt. And so the derivative of g prime of x according to fundamental theorem of calculus is just plug in x here. You get 2 plus x to the 4th raised to the 5th power. And that's it. All right? That's because it's from a constant to x. In part b, same question. Now we have a function capital F of x, which is equal to the depth integral from x to 2 of cosine of t squared dt. And so let's look at the sub difference in this problem. Uh, here, there's a constant in the lower limit of the depth integral and an x in the upper limit. Here, the x is in the lower limit and the constant is in the upper limit. So we need to fix that. We need to reverse this so that the constant is in the lower limit and the x is in the upper limit. So just negate it. The negative, that's equal to negative of the integral from two to x of cosine of t squared dt. Now we can apply the fundamental theorem calculus to this step integral and then take the negative of it, and that's our answer. And so capital F prime of x is, we're just going to say it's negative of the derivative of that using the fundamental theorem of calculus. And so you just plug x in and you get cosine of x squared. And that's the answer. So that's that's the derivative there. And so that's 3b. Well, so that's 3a and 3b. Continue. So that's number three. Okay, so number four. Evaluate the indefinite integral or definite integral. So for part A, uh, we have the definite integral from zero to pi over six of cosecant theta to cotangent theta d theta. Okay, so let's use, we're going to use the fact that um, the using the verb x here, but we can apply it to any letter, right? There it's theta. So ddx of cotangent x is equal to negative cosecant squared x. And so you're going to use that fact uh, to find this integral, right? So we're going to use u substitution. We're going to let u be cotangent theta. Then du will be negative cosecant squared theta d theta. So I'm going to let u equal cotangent theta, then du is negative cosecant squared theta d theta. We have the cosecant um, sorry, wait, wait, sorry, wait. I thought that was a square right there. Sorry. Fix that. Uh, we need a different it's not squared, so forget that. Uh, we're gonna use this fact. Ddx of cosecant x is negative cosecant x cotangent x. Now it matches with that. All right, so um, that also tells us then that the derivative of ddx of negative cosecant x is equal to cosecant x cotangent x. So that means the antiderivative of this function is that function. 
This is equal to negative cosecant theta evaluated from 0 to pi over 6. That's equal to the negative of cosecant of pi over 6. I'm just factoring out the negative. Cosecant of pi over 6 minus cosecant of 0. This is equal to the negative of cosecant is 1 over cosine. So it's 1 over cosine of pi over 6 of minus 1 over, sorry, this is 1 over sine of pi over 6. And this is 1 over sine of 0. Okay, so then this is then um, cosecant is 1 over sine. So this is equal to the negative of 1 over sine of pi over 6 is 1 half. So it's 1 over 1 half minus 1 over sine of 0, which is um, 0. So this is equal to taking the negative 1 over 0 minus 2. That's, in, that's positive infinity minus 2. That's equal to infinity. All right, so, okay, so it's just plus infinity. So the infinite area underneath this curve from 0 to pi over 6, so you get plus infinity. Okay. That's because 1 over 0 is infinity, minus 2 is infinity. Alright, yeah, so you can get infinity as an answer. Okay, so let's just think that. Okay, there's something wrong with the solution. Keep going. Uh, B. Uh, definite term from 1 to 2 of 3 over t to the 4th dt. So that's equal to the definite term from 1 to 2 of 3t to negative 4 dt. That's equal to 3 times the antiderivative, which is t to the negative 3 over negative 3, evaluated from 1 to 2. You just add 1 to the exponent and make that, and then divide by the new exponent, 3 times that. And evaluate from the lower limit to the upper limit of the definite integral. This is equal to 3 over negative 3 is negative 1, and it's times 2 to negative 3 minus 1 to negative 3. That's equal to negative 1 times 1 eighth minus 1. So that's equal to, that would be negative 1 times negative 7 eighths, and so that's 7 eighths. So that's the final answer for 4b, 7 eighths. Right, so this is just applying the um, evaluation theorem here to calculate definite integral. Okay, 4c, integral of 4 over 1 plus 2x cubed, the x, and the hint is let u equal 1 plus 2x. So du is equal to 2 dx. This is equal to, uh, so instead of a 4, I only need a 2 dx here. So I'm going to think of this 4 as 2 times 2, and it's going to be 2 times the integral of 2 dx over 1 plus 2x cubed. So I separate the, the 4 into 2 times 2, so you can see that the 2 dx is right here. And we have du there. So this is equal to 2 times the integral of du over u cubed. And so that's equal to 2 times the antiderivative of u to negative 3, which is u to negative 2 over negative 2, 
plus c. That's negative. 2 over negative 2 is negative 1, so it's negative uh, 1 plus 2x to negative 2 power plus c. And that is the final answer. That's the answer, the most general antiderivative. Negative of 1 plus 2x, negative 2 plus c. That's part c. See, it's interesting to do more problems and have more practice with it, or see some solutions, and then um, you'll understand it better. Okay, so part D is the integral of cosine to the fourth theta sine theta d e theta. And I'm going to let u equal cosine theta. Okay, so u is cosine theta, so du is negative sine theta d theta. We need to know the derivatives of trig functions. Okay, so we have a sine theta d theta, we're missing a negative sine there, so we need to put a negative there. And so to fix that, I'm going to put a negative on the outside, and I'm going to put a negative on the inside, so it's negative sine theta d theta. Well, so that's equal to the negative of the integral. Cosine to the fourth theta is u to the fourth negative sine theta d theta is du. So we get negative the integral of u to the fourth du. And that's equal to negative u to the fifth over five plus c. That's equal to the negative of u, which is cosine theta to the fifth power theta over five plus c. That's the final answer. Right, so that's for d. For e, uh, still finding about the indefinite integral or definite integral. For e is the definite integral from zero to the square root of pi of x cosine of x squared dx. Okay, so now you need to come up with the u substitution on your own. Uh, let u equal x squared because that's what's making the problem weird because you're taking cosine of x squared instead of cosine of x. Let u equal x squared. Du is two x dx. We have an x dx, we're missing a 2, so we're going to put the 2 in. Okay, so I'm going to rearrange the terms also. I'm going to write cosine of x squared times, so there's going to be x dx. I'm going to leave a space there for the 2 that I'm missing. And I'm going to add a 1 half in front. 2 times 1 half is 1. Multiplying by 1 keeps the value of the definite integral, which is a number of the same. This is equal to 1 half the definite integral from 0 to the square root of pi of cosine of x squared, which is u, times 2x dx, which is du. And now this is equal to one half times the antiderivative of cosine u, which is sine of u. Evaluate for the lower limit zero to the upper limit of the square root of pi. And so this is equal to one half times sine of the square root of pi uh, minus the sine of zero. Oh wait, wait, sorry. I did, use, I did use substitution here, so you have to change these x values to corresponding u values here, right? So when x is 0, u is 0. When x is the square root of pi, the square root of pi squared is u is pi. Okay, so we get simple numbers here. You don't have to, but you do. This is 1 half sine of u evaluated from 0 to pi. Okay, this would be 1 half times sine pi minus sine zero. Sine of pi is zero, sine of zero is zero. So this is one half times zero minus zero. And that's zero, so the answer is zero. All right, so the, the answer is zero. How could the answer be zero? Because some of the areas above the x-axis, some is below, and actually the amount of space above the x-axis is the same as the amount of space below the x-axis, which means that the net area is zero. So you can get a definite rule with the zero area, whose values are not zero, right, most of the time. Okay. That's good. Okay, so that's 4e. 
Uh, uh, so I'm going to do 4f just to finish this problem. Okay, so these are just practice problems. The final will not be structured like this. Okay, 4f is find the integral of secant squared x e to the tan x dx. All right, so what's weird here is the exponent of e. You would normally have e dx, now it's e to the tan x. So let's make, let's let u equal e tan x. Let u equal tan x. Then du is the derivative of tan x, which is secant squared x dx. So we have the secant squared x dx, which so we'll make that du. So this is the integral of e to the tan x, which is u, e to the u, times secant squared x dx, which is du. So integral of e to the u du. That's e to the u plus c. Now we substitute for u. This is e to the tan x plus c. That's the final answer. All right? And so that's for f. So I hope this helped you for the final. Um, and so we'll be studying some more for the final. And uh, this is a good start. Okay, bye.